Welcome uh, all of you to our general um, club webinar. Uh, I'm Jinu Chun. Um, I'm at uh, Yonsei University and also IBS, a senior editor of Council of Chemical Research. And um, today's um, general club is on the topic of biosensors on infection diagnostics. And uh, we are very excited to have all of you. Um, before we move on to the uh, main session, uh, let me uh, briefly mention about our journal, which is the uh, Council of Chemical Research. And we have uh, four um, uh, editors. I say um, chemistry journal. Um, um, Cynthia Burroughs is a, uh, um, she's at uh, University of Utah and she is a, uh, our boss at the in chief. And, and uh, I'm one of the uh, um, uh, senior editors um, and, and Abby uh, Doyle at UCLA and Bob Hammers at U of uh, uh, Wisconsin Medicine. We are a team of the journal. We started in 1968 and um, our current uh, impact factor is um, 22. And uh, journal scope, um, it is a very concise and uh, critical article. And we um, uh, go over the, um, we cover uh, basic uh, research and application of um, um, chemistry and also related cr cross boundary disciplines. And uh, we um, uh, focus um, on the, um, the authors on laboratory uh, work. So that means that it is uh, related to, we call it um, seminar um, and, um, in, in uh, article. And we uh, have a few special issues and which covers a very important topic of, you know, um, activities and, and significance. And that's why we have a, a special issue on the topic of advances in biosensor technologies for infection diagnosis, which is our um, JC um, topic of today. And um, um, we uh, are happy to have four distinguished guest editors, um, pro uh, Professor Luke Lee at Harvard Medical School and John Ha Quinn at uh, Darlin Institute and Ha Ko Lee at Harvard Medical School. And uh, we also have a uh, fortune to have a strong ACS uh, support to have a journal club, especially our um, um, thanks goes to Eric Mears, uh, who is an ACS managing editor, and also Marcus Anderson at ACS uh, Marketing. And um, Paco Lee, um, he is a lead um, guest editor, and he's going to be the moderator, and he's going to explain and just go over the introduction of our special issue and also the um, JC. Paco? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Gino, for the the introduction. So, um, so yeah, today's uh, journal club is based on this special issue, as you can see here, the biosensor technologies for you know, infection detection. And we are literally living through it right now, right? So the, the current the COVID-19 pandemic is a really chilling reminder, the threat that, that we got from these infectious diseases. And also there is a new report today, the polio, that a couple of years ago, WHO pronounced that polio was eradicated, but now there is a, the instance of polio uh, in, in, uh, in Malawi today. So human history can be thought of as our struggle against the infectious diseases. And in this timely issue, this special issue, so we wanted to discuss or cover the, our you know, combined efforts to combat against infection. And the topics including pathogenesis, host responses, identifying, identifying biomarkers, and also developing the sensor systems. And we have 12 articles in this issue, and I really encourage you to uh, check uh, this uh, special issue. Next page, please. So uh, today, so we have uh, uh, five speakers who authored the papers in our special issue, as you can see here, and we have arranged four uh, presentations. So each, in each presentation, the speaker or speakers will share their insights on you know, their platform development, as well as the, the future directions for further uh, improvement of this technology. I'm, I'm very excited and also proud to have these you know, world-class speakers today. 
So uh, each presentation is about between 20 to 25 minutes. And after presentation, each presentation will have the short uh, Q&A sessions. And the audience, uh, um, you can put your question in this Q&A window in this uh, Zoom uh, interface. Then I'll read the questions on your PDF. So without further ado, uh, let's move on to our first speaker, uh, Professor Luke Lee at Harvard Medical School. So Luke Lee is the, you know, the expert in biosensors and as well as the, the nanoplasmonics. And in today's uh, presentation, so Luke Lee will share uh, his work on the you know, ultra-fast quantum plasma the PCR for rapid detection of the, the COVID-19. So Luke, can you share your screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you see now? Yep. Okay. So, so thank you for a nice uh, kind uh, introduction. And I, I'm really thankful to ACS account and also uh, Jinu Chan's uh, effort to uh, orchestrate this nice meeting. Uh, today I'll share with you uh, ultra-fast photonic PCR for rapid uh, molecular diagnostic. I made a slight change in terms of title to make it more broad, uh, but I'll cover uh, the uh, quantum plasma and PCR at the end. So I have to really uh, thank to all our previous students and postdocs, as well as a visiting scholar and so on, and funding agents from NSF, NH, DARPA, and so on. So I, it is greeting from our group. Our group is known for biopoet, uh, for writing the healthy uh, uh, poem. So hopefully uh, we can show uh, how we can really uh, develop uh, patient-oriented engineering medicine using uh, diagnostic chip. But before uh, I show a real uh, technical poem, I'd like to share with you uh, just uh, uh, this real poem and share the vision. To see your world in the grain of sand and heaven in the wildflower and whole infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Uh, the William Blake just uh, summarize my research in four line in late uh, 1700s. So it's very fascinating to watch his, uh, uh, I mean, the vision. Uh, let me share with you a uh, short video, video. To see the world in a grain of sand. Is it possible to gaze at the health status of humanity and the earth in a grain of sand? Can we create smart sands to view DNA and RNA fingerprints from our blood and the earth in real time? Reflecting on Blake's poem in our fast-paced world provides an inspiration to find a proactive solution for our global biosecurity. The world is more dangerous today due to the emergence and spread of new infectious diseases. With smart sands, we can prevent such outbreaks from happening through early detection. We propose SANS, speedy, analytical, nano-optofluidic diagnostic systems. Smart SANS are on chip for rapid and accurate molecular diagnostics. Smart SANS can be used by anyone with a smartphone, even in areas where rapid and accurate diagnostics are usually inaccessible. Smart SANS will be globally connected to an integrated data hub Smart Sun's rapid and accurate molecular diagnostic network for human, agricultural, and environmental health will radically improve global healthcare and empower us to create a new proactive, predictive, and preventative paradigm for enhancing global biosecurity. Is it possible to gaze at the health status of humanity and the earth in a grain of sand? This was uh, my proposal. Uh few years ago to Singapore government, but nothing happened, but unfortunately, uh, I'm still working on it, <laughs> okay? Uh, so I hope you got the idea about uh, this sand. Uh, you know, I spent most of my academic life in West Coast, uh, in Silicon Valley. It's sand is really powerful tool. We can think about how to make a smart sand uh, for even diagnostic, not only silicon chip to make microelectromechanical system, uh, but also you can think about how to use uh, detection, LED detection or a microprocessor to handle this data. So uh, our idea of smart sand is nothing but integrated molecular diagnostics uh, for global health. The emphasis is sample to answer device at low cost. 
So uh, we can think about how to make useful disposable uh, detection of the DNA, RNA, or proteins. So we have to really make it affordable, sensitive, and specific, user-friendly, robust, or rapid equipment-free deliverable system. So we've been working on um, since you know 2008, making integrated NASBA. Uh, this is a first microfluidic uh, uh, RNA purification and NASBA. And then Simbas is a, a self-powered uh, uh, microfluidic blood analysis system and sepsis diagnostic by PCR. And then uh, this is the example of the, the handheld uh, point of care uh, diagnostic system that are allowed to do uh, basic sample uh, distribution and then LAMP. And this is done uh, to 2013. Uh, now, uh, and then uh, we've been thinking about how to mass produce this chip uh, with a low cost. So uh, I happened to uh, go to Finland and then work uh, uh, with a Finnish uh, engineer and scientist to develop roll to roll based LAMP chip. And uh, this is the, um, the, the next version of the simple chip pro, uh, self powered integrated microfluidic point of care, uh, low cost enabling uh, molecular diagnostic for infectious disease. Uh, so, this uh, system we integrate uh, uh, basically amplification initiated on top of the fluidic chamber so that we can separate the blood and then. Uh, trap the, all this plasma. And next to this micro well, there is a, a vacuum uh, battery to avoid any uh, bubble. So this is a uh, first integration of a uh, whole uh, system without any uh, worrying about uh, uh, sample preparation. So this allow uh, to drop sample and then you can pump out uh, without any external pump. Uh, because we made a vacuum battery. Vacuum battery allows to make a nice uh, program suctions of the fluid. So you can have a digitization of the individual well. So each well is a reaction for uh, nucleic acid amplification site. So it's a one-step digitization allowed to make a very fast uh, sample prep. And this is the animation of the plasma separation. You can see the blood is moving forward, but you can extract uh, a plasma from a lateral so that you can also see uh, if you make a prop improper design, everything is connected. But if you fix the uh, uh, microfluidic device, you can isolate individual chamber like this so that at the end, uh, you can separate plasma uh, for, uh, in this case, is RPA. So uh, using uh, RPA initiator that we integrated in this well, so you can have a rapid detection of MRSA or HIV RNA detection uh, without any having any other pipette uh, step. And this is an example uh, of the first authorization of the home molecular diagnostic system uh, developed by uh, my previous student. Uh, who work on actually this particular chip. I'm sorry, this one. So uh, it's not exactly the same, but uh, this is the same concept that you can amplify lamp uh, on a chip, and then you can basically integrate system like this. So I'm very proud of the uh, their product, but still we need to make cheaper and faster. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, so we uh, we attempt to demonstrate whether we can make a very fast immunoassay uh, for the SARS-CoV uh, detection using saliva sample. So using saliva sample, uh, you can basically drop the sample, but then you can purify virus. Basically, we want to enrich the virus, and then uh, you can do basic immunoassay using this optical system. Using this system, uh, we are able to push down uh, the, the limit of the detection due to the, I mean, uh, pre-concentration of the uh, uh, passage, I mean, uh, the virus. So that uh, this is the data, this is x-axis, uh, the 
the concentration and this is uh, artificial value uh, with uh, this is raw saliva but if you make a pre-concentration you can improve from like 40 or something to like uh, 30 in terms of the detection limit and then uh, we can also uh, show that uh, in four minute actually a sample prep uh, for pre-concentration take time but in terms of the detection uh, you can detect in four uh, i mean even four seconds uh, but it takes total about 20 minutes in terms of the detection of the immune assay so this is just simple way to pre-concentrate uh, the virus that's the key part uh, to make a, a very uh, fast and quantitative uh, result. Now uh, we have to uh, like to just share with you how to make even faster. Uh, today I didn't I don't have time to talk about the second line and third line, but uh, there are also interesting result uh, to talk about the second and third. But uh, let me focus on the fourth line: eternity in an hour. If we have a uh, you know disease, if we can identify uh, effectively in within our certain, uh, sometimes uh, patients get a wrong uh, treatment with the antibiotic. So we have to think about how to reduce the detection time. So uh, eternity an hour is a key point. Uh, so that's the motivation for ultra fast photonic PCR. So idea is how do you really get inspiration from nature and think about how to speed up the gene amplification. So fast, uh, the gene amplification is the motivation. So uh, we can think about uh, biological inspiration in this uh, photosynthesis synthetic system. The, the leaf uh, basically received photon and then there is electron transfer mechanism. Uh, but then we can really make a similar design uh, using plasmonic uh, to make uh, quantum plasmonic uh, uh, reaction uh, using the PrEP, plasma resonant electron transfer, so that you can reduce uh, basically uh, activation energy and then efficient uh, transfer of the energy. So I'll skip this uh, to, to the time. As you know, uh, the you receive in the photo, I mean the photosynthesis system receive photon. But then uh, the photosystem to uh, get excited and then transfer electron through uh, many, many uh, different protein. Uh, and we have to think about, is it really electron transfer can tunnel through this uh, protein? Uh, so th that's the question. And, but we can really test uh, using PrEP, plasma resonant energy transfer, uh, by uh, checking the uh, protein, uh, whether it's an enzyme, uh, uh, or uh, other protein, you can think about uh, detecting a uh, specific electronic state of this uh, uh, molecule's information. By using the plasmonic, uh, you can uh, capture this identical absorption peak uh, here uh, by quantize the resonant energy uh, quenching dip using this plasmonic structure. So I'll explain again. Uh, so you shine the uh, plasmonic and then generally you get this scattering. But however, uh, if you uh, put the linker molecule and then put the specific enzyme, uh, then uh, you can really capture whether electron is tunneling through this uh, linker or not. Uh, basically, we want to show that electron can tunnel uh, through uh, this junction. Uh, so uh, to do the time again, uh, I guess I have a five minute. I will just highlight uh, the real result. The, I just changed the two different linker molecule. Uh, one is a linear chain, one is aromatic linker with a different distance so that uh, we can prove that uh, there's electron transfer uh, to this enzyme. Uh, so this is the real data. Uh, you can see uh, that this is uh, uh, the peak of this particular enzyme uh, absorption peak. Uh, using this uh, PRAT, uh, we are able to uh, capture this information for different uh, distance of the linker molecule so that you can relate and then plot whether there's a real tunneling behavior or not. So uh, this x axis distance and y axis log so that you can see uh, linear uh, behavior of the, uh, uh, distance first to this tunneling. Uh, so uh, this basically prove uh, that you can really take advantage of this uh, biological electron tunneling in uh, using this plasmonics. Uh, 
So uh, using this concept, uh, we want to really show that we can make ultra uh, fast photonic PCR. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if we integrate this plasmonic structure in the uh, bottom part of the chip, uh, you can uh, think about how to take advantage of, of the plasmonic uh, electron transfer, plasmonic resonant trans energy transfer, so that you can uh, reduce uh, the activation barrier of the, this PCR reaction uh, due to the electronic or vibration excitation of this molecule uh, within this uh, cavity, uh, so that you can have an efficient uh, quantum plasmonic uh, PCR. Uh, so compared to conventional PCR, uh, which is uh, it, which it takes a lot of power consumption, uh, but however this uh, plasmonic PCR uh, we use only a few watt of LED. Uh, then basically you can turn on and off of the light uh, to make a fast heating and cooling uh, using simple LED. Uh, and then uh, basically this is a slightly different design, but. Uh, as long as you have a plasmonic pillar or plasmonic structure, uh, you can make a rapid uh, precision molecular diagnostic. In this case, uh, it's a, uh, basically uh, detecting the MERS CoV. In this case, we pat, I mean, the generate a nice uh, glass uh, pillar structure and then deposit metal so that you can have a nice uh, nanoplasmonic structure. And this showing you that uh, we can detect uh, different uh, you know, uh, the, the, the variation of the uh, COVID, uh, uh, MERS COVID uh, detections. And so hopefully uh, I give you idea that uh, it's on the way, um, we are uh, almost there, that we can develop handheld uh, PCR system that allow to detect uh, many different uh, agricultural uh, issue or food monitoring as well as uh, environmental monitoring or our own uh, personal health care. So that uh, innovative, uh, smart uh, sand can uh, be very useful and effective uh, ultra fast uh, diagnostic uh, system that, that we, we can really think about uh, biosecurity is in our hand. So uh, I'd like to summarize that ultra fast uh, sand uh, uh, diagnostic uh, really require convergence. We really need active learning spirit. And then also uh, team up by multidisciplinary team uh, without really having, you know, you know, argument, we have to have a humble spirit. And also we need to have a micro or nano fabrication technology, the precision spirit and the innovative design uh, with a creative spirit. Then the last part is the uh, most important part that we need to standardize to make a real uh, massive production with the low cost. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, there's, there's very, there are many interesting innovative technologies covered in 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry, <Lenny. laughs> I have to just. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm checking the, the Q&A uh, window, but, um, oh yeah. So there is a question uh, from uh, Jaehyun Lee. So in your the PCI device, prep, prep PCI device chip, mm -hmm. is it disposable or can be used multiple times? It's a disposable, yeah. Disposable chip. Disposable. Yep. Only you need is this plasmonic structure. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's why I'm thinking about uh, best way to manufacture with the road roll or uh, any method, uh, if you can make a nice, uh, this uh, plasmonic nanostructure, uh, then it's, you know, we are in good shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. But the reader, reader excitation uh, source and reader is not, this. you don't have to dispose, you only dispose uh, the chip, yeah. Look, actually, I have a related um, two questions, so if I may. So one is, you briefly mentioned about the pre-processing of the samples, and then the more mm -hmm. we realize that the pre-analytical factors can really affect the, you know, the assay result, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, what is your kind of thought or, yeah, basically the philosophy on the, the 
pre-processing parts? How can you make it better? And oh, as I, I show you briefly, the pre-concentration of the, this COVID virus, that will help in terms of the uh, sensitivity uh, because instead of collecting, even though uh, let's say we have the 10 to the fourth particle, uh, I mean, even, let's assume that we have only 100 particles, but then we missed the chance to detect. So we have to think about what is the best way to make a pre-concentration. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, integrating those pre-concentrator on the chip uh, is a little challenging, but however, uh, we can try our best to uh, improve. Uh, compared to without pre-concentrator. Yeah, ah. definitely. If we have to detect, uh, let's say, a 10 to the 2, or I mean, 10, to, 10 copy, we, sh we should have this pre-concentrate. Yeah, the sensitive detection. Yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there is a question. Uh, so the question is, uh, the, look, what do you think is the best modality uh, for you know, this kind of infection diagnosis in the developing countries or low and middle income countries? That was my uh, vision and dream that I really want to make, I say, 50 cents a PCR chip. <laughs> Even as, uh, I, I'm still working on it. Uh, hopefully uh, next year we'll get something. But anyway, uh, I still I do believe that uh, whether it's a uh, developed country or a developing country, we should have a same kind of the high standard sensitivity using PCR. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if it's not a PCR uh, or just like any isotomal amplification method. Mm -hmm. So people might argue lamp burst RPA or RCA, but still standard is PCR. So uh, it's possible to make PCR chip if we can mass produce mm -hmm. with the road throw, uh, it's coming along. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, nucleic acid amplification assay. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah. Right. Uh, and then uh, the the second question that I had was actually in the in the lab environment, in the like hospital settings, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to control the cross contamination. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in PCR, for example, but in the open environment, such as you know, in the field settings uh, and were in developing countries, controlling the, the cross contamination such that we wouldn't get the false positive would be also a key issue. I think if we can immediately uh, transfer the sample, uh, let's say from uh, nasal swab, as long as we immediately collect, and then uh, that collected sample, this is uh, Lucida's this system. If you put in nasal sample here, and then basically immediately process to this device, that shouldn't have any problem. Uh, this is same as I mean, same Lucida's device. So I. I don't see any problem with that in terms uh -huh. of contamination free. Okay, okay, got it. Because whether uh, we test this at home or uh, in the lab, we have to transfer, uh, you know, swap sample, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you worry about that part, uh, yeah, then it doesn't matter whether it's a lab or in yeah, yeah. you know, a remote area, it's the same. So uh, my idea is uh, we, I want to, we need to make a sample to answer system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of going through many, many uh, pipette steps, uh, yeah. we avoid all these steps. You just drop your sample and mm -hmm. you process. I see. Okay. Um, okay, there is, uh, oh. Jim uh, asked the question. Somebody said uh, 50 cent PCR sounds great. Can you get this done in 10 of minutes? I, 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 yes, I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, making company and executing, <laughs> execution. I was trying to do that in Singapore, but something happened, but yeah. 
And then the second question is uh, over there. So the high force negative uh, with antigen test, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Can you comment on that? I mean, whether it's okay to rely on that kind of test, uh, knowing that they have force negative, yeah, high force negatives. I think it's still, uh, we, the PCR is more, you know, reliable, right? So we have to make uh, PCR cheap as cheap as like letter of law, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, to me it's doable. To me it's doable. Because you only need uh, the nanostructure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Oh, there's another question. So, um, so if it's work and have you tried, you know, plasma heating for uh, nucleic acid extraction, such as DNA or RNA? Yeah, yeah uh, I, I'm sorry that today I didn't present, but you can find our paper, recent paper. We uh -huh. intentionally use a plasmonic uh, structure to uh, lyse uh, the pathogen, like E. coli, and then collect, uh, you know, nucleic acid, and then uh -huh. amplify on same site. So uh, you can read that paper. Somehow I was busy. I, I forgot to in include that. <laughs> Oh, I see, I see. So basically you can use the plasma heating to lyse the cell or lyse the uh, virus uh, and then do PCR on using same system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, somebody might say, oh, there are so many uh, interference. Yeah, if you want to purify, you need to have a purifi purification step, but uh, if you are fine with the detecting, let's, let's say 100 copy, uh, you should be able to get signal, uh, not uh, one copy, but <laughs> hundreds. Okay. Pathogen. Look, maybe it's, this might be the final question. Uh, so in your uh, plasma heating, so I believe you use either uh, the gold film structure or gold nanoparticles. That's right. Uh, do you have uh, any other, I mean, do you have an idea of improving the, the heating efficiency, making like a hybrid particles or doing some nanostructure engineering? It's purely nanostructure engineering. Uh, and I've been working on low cost engineering. Uh, so uh, either film or particle, it worked. Okay. Uh, more important thing is uh, how do you make uniform structure, like chip to chip? Uh, uh -huh. uh, it, it, you know, some people worry about, uh, you know, massive manufacturing with the low cost, uh, with the roll throw, but because there is no nanostructure, but uh, if we can ha make a hybrid system with the, uh, many different material, uh, so as long as there is a plasmonic uh, using different, even to use different material, you don't, you don't need to use gold. I use gold because it's easy to uh, execute, but uh, as long as you resonate with the right frequency, it doesn't matter actually. Uh, I've been thinking about aluminum or, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter uh, which metal you use. Uh -huh. Okay. As long as you know the resonant frequency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Ru, again uh, for this yeah. wonderful uh, presentation. And I really like your poem. I mean, William Brick. Yeah, I'll, I'll, thank you. I'll check it out. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you. Yeah. Um, okay, so then uh, we'll move on to our uh, second presentation uh, by Professor David Erickson from Cornell University. So, um, you know, David, among many other uh, pioneering work, I mean, he's really the leader in developing the, you know, diagnostic systems for mobile uh, and also, you know, global healthcare uh, applications. I still remember um, David presenting or demonstrating this PCR machine using the sunlight, political sunlight and performing the PCR for, uh, the, you know, the point of care settings. That was very impressive. So it's great to have you here, David. Um, Yep, you're all set, you're good to go. I think I am ready. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I really appreciate um, this opportunity. Um, let me, uh, in case I have to, let me please apologize in advance in case my internet um, cuts out, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. So 
hopefully that doesn't become a problem, but um, uh, uh, fair warning if it does. So I'm going to talk about, um, so yeah, as, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of our work in um, point of care technologies, um, all related to um, infectious disease um, and in some way or another, um, but it's going to, uh, I'm going to start at least with a couple of examples that are kind of looking at it in a different way um, and focusing on, you know, a, a different way an infectious disease may affect a um, individual or may present uh, as disease. Um, and we'll focus on that in uh, mostly in limited resource settings and some of the work we do there. Um, and then we'll um, maybe get into some other stuff depending on how quickly I can go. I'm also going to talk, uh, particularly in this first example, a little bit about implementation in, um, in some non-traditional um, environments. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to, um, I'll, I'll, um, depending on how far I get, I'm going to talk about two different things. One is um, point of care diagnosis for something called Kaposi sarcoma that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and um, and then I'll talk a little bit about mobile and, and some of the uh, mobile platforms that we have um, developed over the years and how those actually ended up being um, sort of implemented. Okay, so first, um, this is Kaposi sarcoma. So um, Kaposi sarcoma is a, is a cancer of endothelial cell um, origin. Um, and you can see just a number of um, uh, uh, examples of it. Um, so you might ask the question, um, why um, am I going to be talking about diagnosis of cancer in an infectious disease um, form here? Well, the reason is, is because this particular cancer is caused really by infection of two viruses. So the place where we see this as still being endemic and a problem is primarily where, where we work anyways, is in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, two viruses uh, are, are, are generally the cause of this um, illness. One is HIV, which of course su uh, suppresses immune system. So 95% of patients we see uh, are HIV positive. But the real culprit is something called Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. Uh, it's KSHV, it's a human herpes virus eight. And this is a um, necessary condition of everyone who develops this cancer. So every, it's one of the few um, cancers that we know to be uh, uh, certainly caused by infection, uh, uh, by an infectious disease, uh, or very clearly uh, correlated, I should say. Um, the trick for us here is that the um, virus itself, the KSHV virus itself, is present in about, depending on where you measure, about 40, 60% of all people uh, in the countries in which we work. So that means um, almost, you know, for a good number of the people we, so for example, we couldn't simply um, take a blood test and uh, tell if what we were looking at was particular cancer, because almost everybody has to, uh, it, it's going to be positive for the virus. So um, I'm going to, uh, what we came up with as a hypothesis, um, you know, several, well, what we and my team that I'll talk about in a minute here came up with as hypothesis um, several years ago was that we might be able to um, perform a, a better diagnosis of this cancer um, by quantifying the amount of KSHV DNA that's present in a biopsy. So the way this is diagnosed now is a biopsy is taken that is sent to traditional pathology, and that takes a couple of weeks, and the results aren't particularly very good, um, and it eventually is returned to the patient in sort of a, you know, a couple of weeks if we're lucky. What we tried to do was say, it, perhaps instead of going the traditional route, we can make a point of care test that would be compatible with the healthcare settings in which those patients present and would allow us to quantify the nucleic acid DNA and then perhaps return a, uh, an, uh, an accurate diagnosis based on that. So in a sense, it's sort of a two risk, uh, a, a two risk element. One, we don't know if that, if one, we don't know what the proper technology is to be able to enable that uh, diagnosis or that quantification of the DNA, and B, we don't know that even if we could do that, uh, that will return a successful diagnosis. Our hope, that, so that's where we started, um, and um, you know, the idea in the long term is to be able to do easier and faster, more accurate. But if we enable this easier and faster diagnosis, um, we can improve survival. So we, we've put together a relatively large team around this, um, you know, uh, focused uh, the engineering here in Ithaca at Cornell, but also participants from 
um, our, our medical school in, uh, in Weill in New York City at University of California, San Francisco. Um, and of course, our, our big clinical epidemiology team uh, centered at the Infectious Diseases Institute in Uganda. And I will talk a little bit about how that is expanding um, on, but I'll just maybe echo that um, Luke Lee made earlier, these, you know, the both development uh, and implementation of these types of technologies really does require a very significant multidisciplinary, multinational team. So ultimately, the technology we developed, um, you mentioned, it was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the ability to do PCR using sunlight. Uh, that technology evolved, uh, and I can explain perhaps in question and answer, but by working very, very closely with users on the ground, that technology eventually evolved into what you see here, which is which we call Tiny. You can see it's a self-contained box, um, a, a little smaller than a lunchbox, um, portable, easy to use. Um, it, it will show in a minute here, it uses LAMP to perform the nucleic acid amplification. Um, it, we use, it does 6X multiplexing uh, using PCR tube uh, consumables. Um, it has the ability to operate off of electric battery, battery, solar and thermal energy. And you can sort of see at the bottom there a couple of points where we can kind of run this machine um, by, you know, uh, running it off electricity. We can run it off a small Bunsen burner. We can run it off of um, solar energy. You can run off any number of different things, depending on what the need case is. Uh, and a key to it is that there, the, within the system, there's phase change materials that allows us to keep a very, that very, very stable temperature uh, required for lamp-based amplification. Um, one of the reasons why that is very important for us is because in places where we operate, the um, much like my internet is not stable now, often the electricity is not stable. And so that can mean that um, uh, the, we, we cannot necessarily rely on sustainable power source. So this sort of robustness abilities to operate and ability to maintain temperatures in the absence of input energy into the system makes us much more robust against those types of inter uh, interruptions. And again, that's something we've, we've learned by, by um, uh, many years. Uh, I think maybe this group, I don't need to explain this to, but you know, the, we are doing a nucleic acid amplification. Um, we are implementing that in uh, LAMP, a LAMP-based protocol. Uh, from a practical matter, uh, what that matters, you know, in terms of operations is that we are simply maintaining it at a simple, stable temperature rather than thermal cycling. Um, if you look inside our, our tiny machine, just to give the engineers a peek at something, this is what sort of the, um, uh, the guts of it look like. So you get inside um, the system here. This is the one, two, three, four, five, six multiplexing um, way. We have the, the if you make, take a cut section of the element of this, LED shines down uh, and illuminates these um, called PCR tubes, but of course they're lamp tubes. Uh, here, um, uh, photodiodes at the bottom monitor um, both um, fluorescence, two color fluorescence, um, evergreen uh, and Brox, and then also ability to measure um, turbidity at the same time. Um, measurement unit sits in there. You can see where that phase change material sits and, and again maintains. The trick to the phase change material is that it melts at the lamp uh, desired temperature. So we can heat the system up to the top end of that phase change. Uh, and then as it cools, instead of the system cooling, the energy for as it solidifies, uh, maintains that constant temperature. Um, for details, you can look at our, our recent uh, Nature uh, Biomedical Engineering paper. Okay, so implementation, I just want to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, when we implement this technology, I thought this might be a little something different for the group here. So as I say, we're centered um, in Kampala, um, Uganda. Um, with the way we uh, enter patients into the study is through um, it, it's through a number of sites that I'll talk about later. But they're admitted. Anybody admitted with clinically suspected Kaposi sarcoma um, is admitted um, as long as they're above the age of 18. Um, they're read in uh, with an explanation and written informed consent. Um, the, their clinical history is taken. Um, they're administered um, a uh, 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 anesthetic. A four millimeter punch bi biopsy is taken. Again, this is the sort of standard of care um, in, in this area or anywhere basically. Uh, and then that biopsy is, is taken and, and ultimately split in two. Um, 
again, to, to get the validation for something like this is pretty complicated. Um, so I'll just walk you through this quickly, but um, that biopsy we take is cut in half. Half of it goes down the traditional um, diagnostic path, uh, in which in Uganda is H&E evaluation. Um, after that, um, it is um, sent to, um, the, the slides are sent to um, uh, Cornell, our, our hospital in New York City. Uh, they're done an anti-Lana stain um, to get, and then read by essentially two pathologists, one in at Cornell and one at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and if there is concordance between those two, we call that the gold standard. Uh, at the same time, we do molecular diagnosis, take the other half of that biopsy, and that goes down one of two paths in the validation phase of the study. The, that half was also shipped back to um, uh, Cornell, where we did um, LAMP and uh, PCR. And then now we're in the point of care phase of the study, where now all those uh, biopsies are processed uh, on site uh, and um, the nucleic acid done uh, uh, and the, the tiny analysis done at one of 11 sites that I'll talk about later. This is just to give you an idea of what the variety of what we see looks like. So this is um, just uh, you know photos of, of some of the lesions that as they present, you can see it's a wide variety of things, very difficult to classify um, clinically. Um, so big result, this is the big result. So again, based on all that um, tiny work that we did collecting, we've collected now, well, uh, close to, I better not, since this is, uh, at this point, we had collected 500 samples. Now we're, I believe, well more than double that. I believe close to 1,200 uh, patients uh, that we've seen. Um, when we do the numbers compared to gold standard uh, pathology in the United States, our, our sort of lamp-based assay conducted in tiny um, at um, gives us an uh, area under the curve here. This is our ROC curve of about 0.96. Uh, and uh, at a sensitivity of 99%, because you really want a high sensitivity for something like cancer, um, we get a, a specificity of 92%, um, which is quite a good quite a good result, something I'm quite uh, proud of and, and exceeds both in terms of the quickness we can return result uh, in principle uh, and uh, the accuracy of the result that's turned, uh, returned um, compared to um, standard of care. Um, so where we are now, so we're now in um, the <coughs> sort of system rollout and expansion phase. We have we are, have sites, um, 11 different sites um, across Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see there are four sites in um, Uganda, Tanzania, Malawi, Rwanda, Botswana, and Kenya, um, where uh, we are rolling out these um, sites and are in most of these um, are at the point where uh, where they are um, processing patients and now using systems. Some of them are still a little bit coming online, but it is um, you know relatively large scale operation at this point. And I, I call it my good colleague, Agri Samir, um, here who is leading the effort um, within uh, the clinical rollout within, within Africa. Um, so I got a six or seven minutes or a little bit more than, than five minutes left. So let me try to go through the rest of this quickly. Again, talking about mobile point of care diagnostics. Um, again, just in the in the with the goal of doing something a little bit different here. Um, uh, I'll talk first about uh, nutrition um, and and uh, its role in immunity. So we're talking about detection of infectious disease, but of course, uh, it is better to be protected against um, infection than have to deal with it. And uh, good nutrition is um, is a way to do that. Uh, there's a number of roles here of uh, reasons, you know, uh, why nutrition um, is important for immunity. Um, you know, there's some nutrients have specific antibacterial antiviral functions. Others are regulators of immune cell uh, metabolism. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of these things, but suffice it to say that um, proper micronutrient status can be important for um, a good immunity. Um, I call it the citation at the bottom if anybody's really interested, and that's where these images come from. Uh, we focus mostly on micronutrient, um, um, micronutrient deficiency, it's called, sometimes called the hidden hunger, because unlike say a macronutrient deficiency where you might be able to tell on the outside uh, or present uh, <coughs> very clear clinically um, issues, um, hidden hunger such as iron deficiency, various vitamins or, or other mineral deficiencies um, do not necessarily um, uh, present uh, in an obvious way and so therefore require a diagnosis. Um, we'll talk um, 
Oh, and and then as I should as I say here, so we we have I should um, we have taken steps towards commercializing this through a company called VitaScan, and so part of my conflict of interest is that I have to to notify that. Um, one thing I will say is that in all our mobile-based implementations of this, we we've developed set, used separate readers rather than anything attached that attaches to the the phone, uh, and that's partly for um, regulatory reasons, partly for other reasons that um, uh, I can talk about um, if there's questions. So, um, you know, uh, just to give you an idea, I'll talk. We several years ago we, we published something multiplex for vitamin A deficiency and iron deficiency. Um, vitamin A deficiency, um, you know, uh, it causes night blindness, immune disorder, and deficiency causes uh, anemia uh, and uh, a very long Oh, I think we have a little bit of connection problem here. Um, let's just wait a little bit. Oh, yeah, apologies. Uh, I think David uh, tried to reconnect. Uh, yep. Well, but it was very, very interesting talk so far. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Hello, hello. Am I back? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. You can't say you can't say I didn't warn you. Um, okay, that should be good, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, so as I say, what we have done, what we have worked on is um, sort of a imaging compatible. Um, lateral flow type strip that allows us to um, image, um, uh, detect um, essentially three different markers uh, in parallel, two related to um, uh, vitamin A and vitamin, um, and, sorry, and, and ferritin, a marker of iron deficiency, and a third one to um, mark the presence of um, infection or inflammation and CRP. And that's important because that can, uh, uh, affect um, a number of different elements of um, of one's immune system. Uh, and so that can knock, uh, make the readings on the vitamin uh, side to be um, less uh, accurate. Um, so as you can see, it sort of looks like this. We use fluorescence uh, mode, different color fluorescent modes for a number of reasons. One is it allows us to detect uh, nonspecific signals uh, accurately and um, uh, and, uh, and and differentiate between the, the different targets uh, more uh, accurately. Um, this is just a number of different patients. So this is a healthy uh, sample here. You can see we get numbers in the um, accurate range. Um, uh, iron deficiency, you can see ferritin is low. Uh, vitamin A deficiency, you can see here retinol binding protein is low. You can see cases where we get double, double low co coexistence in both cases. And you can see numbers are really get wild when someone has a high CRP, which is which is typically consistent with um, some form of inflammation. Okay, um, and this is just a comparison, just uh, comparing our results um, with our lateral flow here device read on our uh, sort of remote mobile um, system um, at, with uh, human human results. I believe there's about fifty human results here that we um, uh, compare these with and get relatively good. Um, agreement between them. Again, if, if you're interested, uh, I suggest uh, I'm happy to refer you to this PNAS paper for 2017. Um, I think I'm a little bit over time given my um, internet troubles here. Um, I'll just very quickly, um, for anybody that's interested, we do a lot of work also on um, viral infections, um, particularly in uh, South America. This is from several years ago um, in um, 
uh, in Ecuador. Um, we were um, on the ground uh, testing out some of our dengue and chikungunya stuff at exactly the same time that Zika virus was first um, discovered there. Uh, you will note the, the misspelling in the, of smartphone in the, in the, in the um, headline here. Um, I won't go through, I guess, I, uh, given the time, I won't go through this, but, uh, you know, I highly, if anybody's interested, you know, that the, we, the Nutrophone has been our, our nutrition technology. Feverphone is sort of the compatible, compatible element on the, uh, on the febrile illness side. We've got some multiplex uh, stuff for dengue and chikungunya. Um, you can check out this analytical chemistry paper. We're trying to do uh, fourplex detection on both dengue, IgG, chikungunya, IgG, uh, IgM, and IgM all in the same uh, kind of test strip and we get uh, really good um, areas into the curves, uh, curve and, and high sensitivities and specificities. Um, so I'll skip the rest of this uh, and just uh, and thank again everyone for um, the, the ability to speak here today and I'm happy to open it up to um, questions. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, yeah, actually you have a Eight minutes. <laughs> oh, there's any one. I can yeah, finish. Have more okay, time. I, I, yeah. I, I do. If I have eight minutes, I can. I, I'll take the three minutes and finish yeah, up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Sorry, I, I must have the time wrong here. Okay, so um, the um, so that's dengue chikungunya. What the the other element again that that is really really important, I think, in infectious disease going forward, is the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Um, this is uh, the chart here um, compares, um, I think it's, it's not a surprise to this group that, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the growth of drug resistant organisms worldwide. I think what might be a surprise is, is how the, the rapidity with which that is rising and how large the problem is likely to be, you know, in order 30 years. Um, uh, so this is this chart. The um, my left certainly of this chart here shows what um, the kind of deaths worldwide for antimicrobial resistance now um, annually about seven hundred thousand. Um, you know, as the resistance problem grows, um, it's projected that, that could get to ten million worldwide uh, by twenty fifty, which, as you can see here, is roughly consistent with what cancer is um, uh, now. Um, so there's a lot of issues, of course, with antimicrobial resistance. What we've been working on is sort of, uh, and, and a lot of it has, to, of course, to do with overprescription. Um, a lot of it has to do with lack of, of drug development in the pipeline um, and so forth. Um, so the, the sort of general strategy that's used is to both be smarter and, uh, you know, to, to try to enhance deliver development of new antibiotics, but also slow down the resistivity of um, existing ones. And, uh, and a way to do that is via very simple tests that can get when a pre patient presents uh, with an infection, very simple tests that can test, tell whether or not um, it is likely to, the, that organism would likely be uh, resistant or susceptible to a given antibiotic. So we've been looking, um, developing a number of tests that look something like this um, in a very, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it uh, right now, but um, if you go, you see these sort of um, circle things here, these are paper-based assays. Um, in, um, actually, maybe I think it's easier if I just go here. So, so this is an example of comparing the results for um, a uh, test that is antibiotic susceptible or an organism that is susceptible to a particular antibiotic, uh, ampicillin in this case, and one that is resistant to it. And so in this case, we have going around this circle here, we have increasing concentrations of antibiotic, okay? Uh, and uh, in this case, Presto Blue, a dye that is metabolized or that in the presence of active living organisms uh, will change color for, for the purposes of this talk, okay? So here you can see in this case, uh, as this, uh, in this top one here, A, this organism we put in the middle, it spreads out and starts trying to grow in each of these little chambers. You can see that as the going around counterclockwise, as the um, susceptibility, um, as the concentration of antibiotic increases, eventually get to a point that um, the organism can't grow, right? And so that would quite, we can relate that to something called the minimum inhibitory concentration. You can see, uh, and so here you can see though, um, this, uh, we get growth at sort of all stages that turning pink or at very many stages. It implies that this is an organism that is resistant to the 
uh, antibiotic care. Here with the opposite, we put it in the negative or the control spot um, lights up, but you can see all the antibiotic spots do not light up. So there's no growth. We know that to be a antibiotic um, resistant, uh, or sorry, susceptible organism. So it'd be appropriate to uh, administer this type of um, antibiotic. Um, so here, you, and this is just some data. Again, you can look at this ACS Omega paper, some data here showing that we get good correlation with standard methods. We've been uh, really, um, um, uh, working recently on carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, um, which is one of the uh, an urgent level threat for uh, as determined by the CDC. Um, this is what that looks like uh, in our organisms. Here we sort of advance the technology so that it can do um, test against three different um, uh, antibiotics: ciprofloxacin, meropenem, and gentamicin. Here you can see the difference between a couple of different strains of the same organism. Um, both are um, uh, susceptible to superfloxin. One of them is um, um, uh, uh, resistant to uh, meropenem and, another, and, and gentamicin, and another one is, is uh, uh, resistant to, uh, susceptible to gentamicin, but resi um, uh, susceptible to meropenem. So the ability to kind of have these simple tests uh, and be able to make quick diagnoses as to the likely efficacy of, of uh, antibiotic is something that can make us smarter at administering antibiotics and hopefully um, do that in a quicker way. Okay, this time I really will end here. Uh, and again, thank uh, the organizers and everyone for giving me the chance to speak. Thank you, thank you, David. That's wonderful, wonderful technology. So yep, the session is open to questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Or I can start off. <clears throat> Maybe I, I'm, I'm wondering if so the, the tiny PCR system um, from, from the purely logistic point of view, what is the price? And also, what is the price per test? Yeah. Um, so the, the price per test right now is, 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 is very low. Like, you know, the, the amount of reagents, so I don't know, the amount of reagents that we have in there is, is, is very cheap uh, and the consumable is very low. Uh, the instrument itself um, is, is quite low um, on the order. You know, we make them for about, um, you know, for order $500, um, you know, whether in production, it's hard to, you know, it would be, you could you know, modify that. Um, I think, you know, low, low price is, is certainly important, um, but I think more, more important than that is sort of ease of use uh, and, um, and, and, and working with the, um, the ultimate, you know, co-development with the, with the ultimate users of it, I think is much more important than, um, than a, I don't mean to imply that price point isn't important, price point is important, but, but uh, you know, working with the users to develop something and having their uptake, I think, is is a is the larger is a larger barrier to um, getting widespread adoption of a lot of this uh, kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at if you look if you look at now, well, you know, what at the discounted price for a TB um, diagnosis, uh, you know, for for a gene expert, something like ten dollars, uh, and the machine and I, the machine is, is at least last I checked is maybe a you know a few thousand. Um, those are those are relatively high prices, but still there is sort of broad availability um, of that. So, um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Good points. David, can I ask one question? Sure, yeah. please. Excellent job. Uh, wonderful. Uh, the last one, I really enjoyed the last part, uh, that uh, drug resistance antibiotic uh, test. Is that... Uh, by, I mean, blood sample or, and then uh, does it include the sample prep or how does it work at the yeah, end? Um, so um, we're, we're doing a number of them. That, the one that I didn't talk about um, that um, is probably, because it's a little bit earlier stage, mm -hmm. um, but the one that um, I think is, is probably going to be the, the bigger impact one is on gonorrhea. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a urine sample or a swab or, you know, a swab or a urine sample. Oh, great. Um, and in, in that case, we can do the, the sample. We've sort of, my student has sort of figured out a way that we might be able to use the whole organism. Mm -hmm. And so it's really becomes a matter of concentrating it mm -hmm. and then being able to, to run it on there um, uh, in, in a much more simpler uh, sample processing um, kind of way. Um, 
but that's sort of in development um, okay. at the present time is what I would say. That's great, congratulations. Yeah. Cool, great. Um, have you planned to use tiny on your? Oh, there's a question by uh, Chino. So, uh, David, do you have a plan to use your tiny system in the airports or you know healthcare mm -hmm. centers? Not not only yeah. developing country, but also develop the country, right? Yeah. Um, so there, the you know, the, you can imagine scenarios where um, you know we don't really talk about this now, but, you know, a, a year and a half ago, we were talking about screening every, you know, doing rapid PCR tests, hundred, everybody comes off an airplane and having an instrument right there that can just kind of, um, you know, and, and we, we got some grant funding to kind of develop it down there. What I would say is I think um, there's certainly a possibility for that. I think um, this kind of technology, you know, for, for this specific thing is going to be better, um, uh, suited for scenarios where you get handfuls of patients that present, you know, on a day or in a week, um, you know, it, it very rarely that um, in this kind of a scenario, you show up with, um, you know, you show up with yourself and hundred of your buddies to get screened for Kaposi sarcoma. Right. Uh -huh. um, so I think that the use case for something like this is, is, is going to be more having something that can be there and ready to go. Uh -huh. Where we where we are going, the direction we're going with that is is HPV screening, where you can where there are um, where there is evidence to suggest that if you can show up, um, do a hundred screening tests, self administered screening tests, return results that you know immediately before you leave, um, that there can be better clinical outcomes um, for something like that. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that'll probably be what the direction we would go in. Yeah, but that's the direction we are going in. So. Yep, great, great points. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, okay, last question. So, oh, sorry about that. Uh, great talk, David. Um, my question is related to the, uh, the KS detection as well. Have you thought about um, trying to sort of the decrease amount of the starting sample you need um, yeah. in terms of the tissue? And second question related is that at what threshold do you need to then sort of forego the tissue diagnosis, the sort of the so-called gold standard just to completely rely on PCR since the performance seems to be really great. Yeah. Well, part of, you know, part of that would be getting a clearance, right? So there's a regulatory part of that, that we would, you know, ha ha have to get done so, uh, to, to actually implement it. So, um, you know, get, getting that get done and doing manufacturing, you know, we do, we, we have ma manufacturing facilities in my lab that we can do things, but they're not, you know, cleared for CE marking or, or FDA. So there's a regulatory part that now that we have these results, we might be able to advance um, with. Um, sorry, I forget the first part of your question. It's sort of, uh, you know, it seems like the most morbid part of the entire diagnostic process flow is the biopsy itself. Have you thought yeah. about maybe try to use a needle base or something that's less invasive to actually acquire the tissue? Uh, yeah. So that, the, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So so the the prob the practical problem. So you know we take a four mil as as you are getting at. We take a four millimeter biopsy, which you know requires a stitch. You know anesthetic, a stitch, everything. Um, you know you'd rather not have to do that. Um, the the issue with um, doing a finer uh, needle um, with that is we don't get your your the the biopsy itself is not homogeneous. It's heterogeneous, and so when you take a single sample like that, you're, you, the portion of the biopsy you get can't be guaranteed to be representative of what the actual biopsy is, if you sort of understand what I mean. We really need, at the present, we really need that larger piece to be able to sure we're properly sampling everything and getting a, a good result as opposed, because with a fine needle, you could just go through and miss the whole thing and you get, you know, the last thing you want to do is give a false um, negative. Right. So we need to do that. Now, having said that, what is really important for us is to be able to process the biopsy quicker than we are now. And so what we are, are um, uh, working with our big effort now that, that the, the things look good here is to be able to um, we process all the biopsies on site now, but to do it in a, in a, a quicker, more efficient way, I think, is, is the next big challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a very stimulating panel discussion here. Um, OK, thank you, David. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to our uh, third speaker, uh, Professor Ajima Chin from uh, Dalin Institute.
uh, for chemical physics and Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, yeah, China is working on you know making this. I think I say the engineered system uh, of tissues or organs uh, to study the disease as well as the, the healthy uh, status. And today, I think she's going to share her uh, research on using this organ on a chip uh, for COVID nineteen uh, research. Thank you so much, Fujina. Uh, please, you can go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Right. Yep. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation from the ACR Journal and uh, Jinwoo. Uh, it's my great pleasure here and join this wonderful webinar. So today, I'm going to share with you now recent work on the uh, use of the organ chip for COVID-19 research. So uh, we think that the currently the huge challenge in biomedical field is that we are in the best of times with the rapid development in fundamental science and the completion of the full sequencing of the human genome and the discovery of the new genes and proteins associated with several disease. However, uh, we are also in the worst of the times with the global health issues, such as the increased uh, number of cancer, neurological disorders, and many, many diseases uncured. And especially we are also facing the uh, viral pandemic, the COVID-19 challenges. And SARS-CoV-2 has caused a COVID-19 pandemic. It has affected the global human health and society all over the world. And currently, the COVID-19 is regarded as a systematic disease and many, many organs can be affected such as the lung, brain, heart, kidney, and intestine. With the new variants such as Omicron uh, emerging and the development of the new drugs to manage the COVID-19 uh, effectively is a challenging and time-consuming process. So this encourages the extensive investigation of the disease uh, pathogenesis and the novel therapeutics so actually right now, there are several different types of the experimental system available for the study of uh, SARS-CoV-2, including the cell-based and animal-based models. And these models have, have the understanding of this, the novel virus. However, the model system, uh, all these model systems still have some limitations. And the model system that can accurately uh, reflect the human responses to the uh, novel virus are uh, still lacking. So the organ chip or even the stem cells organoid are emerging as the two new model system for viral research, including the SARS-CoV-2 study. So we all know that in the past 10 years, the organ chip and the microphysiological system have provided the capability uh, for replicating many aspects of the human physiology and pathology. And uh, this organ chips permits the analysis of intercellular communication and tissue-tissue interaction in a more organ-relevant context. It also increased the sensibility of the cellular control to improve the, their functional readouts. So actually right now, the organ chip have been successfully utilized for studying the human infectious disease caused by virus, bacteria, fungi, and other uh, pathogens in the past few years. And this slide gave an overview of what we have done in my lab in the uh, past few years. Actually, we are motivated by exploring the human physiology in normal and disease microscale technology with the cell biology, material, and medical science. We focus on the development of organ chip and stem cells or uh, organoids physiological system with their target application in studying tissue and organ development, infectious disease, and the drug testing. So in the following talk, I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, three stories, 
how we use the, the uh, different organ infection caused by uh, SARS-CoV-2. So as we know, the lung is the primary target for SARS-CoV-2 and many severe uh, COVID-19 cases can develop uh, into progressive the lung injury, inflammation and pneumonia in clinic. And actually in vivo, the avalurus is the fun, uh, the avalurus is the fu uh, functional unit of the lung, and the avalur capillary barrier play a very important role in supporting the gas exchange and preventing the uh, invasion of the pathogens. In order to model the lung infection uh, on chip, so we constructed the avalur chip in a multilayer microfluidic device, as shown here. So the lung chip is simply, uh, is simply uh, designed with the two perfused the channel separated by a porous memory. And the avular capillary barrier is formed by the co-culture of avular epithelial cells and the pulmonary uh, microvascular endothelial cells and the circulating uh, immunocells in the vascular uh, channel as shown here. And all the co-culture of these uh, cells are co-cultured under the fluidic condition. As shown in this picture, uh, actually after co-culture of these cells for three days, and the integrity of the form tissue barrier was uh, characterized by the expression of the adherent junction protein uh, in the epithelium epithelium and the endothelium uh, on the chip. And in this, uh, in this experiment, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, was inoculated into the top channel in every side. And three days, uh, days post-infection, we test the responses of different cell types to the virus. So notably, we find the virus mainly infects and replicates in the avular uh, epithelium, which is in uh, identified by the viral uh, spike protein here. And also in addition, the viral particles uh, were also detected by the TM microscope in the infected epithelial cells. So in order to fully understand the host uh, responses to SARS-CoV-2, and we also perform uh, an RNA sequencing analysis of the both cells on the chip, as shown in these uh, figures, the viral load uh, in avalur epithelial cells was, uh, was much higher uh, than that in the vascular endothelial cells. And also the enrichment analysis showed the SARS-CoV-2 infection induced a broad immune uh, response, including the type one uh, interfering and cytomediated uh, signaling pathway in epithelial cells. And also it can induce the activity, a uh, junk state cascade and the adaptive immune responses in the in endothelial cells. So all these results reveal the diverse responses of the avular epithelial cells and endothelial cells to viral infection. And also uh, it reflects a possible uh, crosstalk between the two cell types during the viral infection. So at the blood immunocells are very important in antiviral function level. So we further investigate the roles of uh, blood immunocells in the process of lung infection on chip. So in this work, the circulate, uh, circulating immunocells were isolated from the healthy human blood from the volunteers, and they were infused into the bottom uh, vascular channel of the lung chip after the viral infection. Striking, we find more adhesion of the blood immunocells on the vascular uh, endothelium, especially the CD14 uh, positive cells, monocytes uh, here. And at the same time, we also test the robust 
released of the pro-inflammatory cytokines in channels with the presence of the immunocells. So we think all these results revealed that the circulating immunocells are involved in uh, the inflammatory responses following the lung infection here. Besides, we find the in, uh, infusion of the blood immunocells in vascular site can exhibit the damage of the integrity in endothelium, such as the disrupted uh, of a uh, herring junction and the endothelial cells detachment from the lung chip. And this re activated immunocells are involved in the inflammatory responses, which might exacerbate the vascular injury uh, in lung uh, infection. And actually the results are similar to those found from the clinical uh, samples. So to better understand the molecular basis of the COVID-19 disease, we further perform a proteomic analysis of the, uh, of the lung cells after the viral infection. We find these virus uh, infect the alveolar epithelial cells and can cause a global proteomic and mark a remodeling of the uh, organelles. And we, see, uh, we assume the release the set of kinds from the infected alveolar epithelial cells could induce the injury of the neighbor uh, endothelial cells in an indirect manner. And they also uh, reflect the complex in cell cell interaction communication during the SARS uh, CoV 2 infection. So we think the benefit of the, this chip is that the capability to replicate the lung pathophysiology of COVID-19 and the accessibility to visualize the dynamic cellular behavior in real time here. And also actually all those results are not easily achieved by the traditional in vitro models. I provide a promising platform for studying the disease pathogenesis and the test the drug candidate with the fast speech and the low cost. So uh, beside the lung, another story is uh, the clinical uh, evidence suggests that the intestine is another high risk of infection. So here we try to create an intestinal uh, tissue barrier on chip by co-culture uh, of the intestinal, epithelial, and endothelial cells in fluidic uh, condition. And actually this condition allows to the, form the intestinal, epithelial, uh, the tissue barrier and study the tissue infection induced by this virus at the tissue level. Here we can say from the imaging, we are able to see the formation of the intestinal epithelium and endothelial barrier and the fluid condition of the 3D uh, culture. So all this, uh, the formation of this uh, tissue barrier uh, formed the end of the uh, normal condition. After the SARS-CoV-2 infection, we also detected viral infection and relocation in intestinal epithelium, as shown here. And this suggests the intestinal uh, epithelium might be a potential portal uh, for viral transmission. And also uh, this results uh, we observed on the vascular side, the adherent junction between the endothelial cells were seriously disrupted. And also we don't find the spike uh, positive cells in endothelium. So we think the, this indicate the possible across talk between the epithelium and the endothelium in the in mediating the endothelial uh, injury. So it's a very uh, complex the cell interaction behind the viral infection. And also the RNA sequence analysis uh, 
revealed the viral infection can induce abnormal the RNA and protein metabolism and activity the immune responses and also the upregulated uh, inflammatory cytokine related uh, genes in both the cell types. And also we think this might contribute to the injury of the intestinal barrier caused by SARS-CoV-2 here. So, uh, this work actually, we, we just uh, try to test the responses of the T cell to this viral infection. So in the last story, we start to move to uh, focus on the brain, the possible brain infection here. So we know in addition to lung and intestine, actually it's noted that 13 to 40% uh, uh, suffer from obvious neurological symptoms uh, in clinic, such as the uh, headache, dizziness, cerebral injury, and seizures. However, the cause of these neurological uh, symptoms is not clear. And the main question is uh, whether these changes are caused by the direct viral uh, neural invasion or systematic inflammation. That's the question we hope to target in this work. So considering uh, the COVID-19 is a systematic disease. So in this work, we try to uh, establish a linked multi-organ model. So here we establish a linked long brain uh, system by integrating an alveolar chip in the blood brain barrier chip here. And to test the uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection at the systematic level, the virus were uh, inoculated in the long chip and then uh, an uh, nano, uh, analysis the effects of the viral infection on the brain. So we, we conduct, uh, conducted all the experiment on the, linked, uh, on the linked chip here. And at the very beginning, we characterized the integrity of the alveolar chip by concussion of the alveolar epithelial cells and primary endothelial cells for three days in the fluidic condition here. And also we uh, the integrity of the blood brain barrier uh, chip and by co coaching of the brain uh, endothelial cells, astrocytes, and the microglia uh, cells, uh, and the fluidic condition as well. So we, we are able to say uh, they can form the very good uh, barrier, uh, function barrier on this uh, dynamic condition. So in order to test the possible invasion of the SARS-CoV-2 by, uh, by BBB or blood brain barrier, we first conducted a direct viral exposure on the chip alone. So after three days uh, infection, we actually we, we don't find visible changes of uh, BBB permeability and the viral replication in the three types of the brain uh, cell types. And also this seems uh, the BBB is less, uh, uh, is less permissive to the direct infection by SARS-CoV-2. And also that means the probability of the direct neural invasion of this virus by blood brain barrier is very low. So uh, the, uh, the viral exposure has no visibility uh, effects on this BBB chip. So we then assumed the neuropathological changes might be uh, caused by the systematic inflammation following lung infection in an indirect manner. So in order to verify the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis uh, the endothelial medium of the SARS-CoV-2 infected alveolar chips was infused into the BBB chip. And the results show the infused the medium can cause the disrupted of the endothelial integrity, the glare and 
activation and the release of those uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines on the BBB chip. To gain, uh, in order to gain a comprehensive overview of the molecule signatures underlying the BBB injury, we also perform the RNA sequence analysis of those brain endothelial cells. So here we identify the ACTB genes uh, was down regulated significantly, uh, which encodes the beta uh, actin protein. So in addition, the confocal, we, we perform the confocal uh, analysis. The imaging demonstrates the SARS-CoV-2 infection can cause a reduction in the level of beta actin protein and the rearrangement of the actin uh, cytoskeleton here. So what's more, we find the cool localization of the actin cytoskeleton and the tight conjunction uh, at the cellular uh, border following the uh, were decreased following the viral infection. And we think the results indicate the viral infection might damage the brain endothelium while downregulating the actin skeleton. So from this work, we assume the uh, SARS-CoV-2 might be able to uh, damage the brain and also they may caused by the uh, indirect manner uh, following the lung, uh, lung infection. So that's the main results we obtained from this work. So in summary, actually, these organ chip the models uh, can demonstrate the potential for the study of the pathogenesis, uh, pathogenesis from uh, of the COVID-19. So we think they are able to uh, test or study of the disease uh, uh, pathogenesis in a single organ or even the multi-organ manner, uh, manner. Actually, it's not difficult to conduct by the 2D or the 3D, traditional 3D culture uh, model. And we think probably this model system might be used for the candidates in the future. And due to the experimental limitation actually here, we don't conduct a lot of the drug test in the in this experiment uh, because all this uh, work uh, conducting the P3 uh, lab is very limited condition. So actually, uh, actually, I can add up uh, my talk with a very short summary. The organ chip offer microphysiological analysis platform for infections to be started in a simple and low cost manner. I us to vid, uh, visualize the dynamic process of the pathological responses and reflecting the interaction between the different cells and tissues in normal and disease. And it facilitates to mimic the human pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19 in a human relevant context which might support the study of the disease and the drug testing in the in, uh, future. In the end of work, we also, in future, we, we envision the, com uh, the combination of the organoid, stem cell organoid with the organ chip might provide the new uh, tool for the future study and deep understanding of the uh, COVID-19 and uh, develop a novel tool for the uh, novel therapeutics in the future. So in the end, I want to thank my lab, including the staff and postdoc and students. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gina. Uh, that, was, that was fascinating. I mean, not only one, but thank you have you. three organs. Yeah, one or two. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm checking the, the Q&A window. Um, there are two questions, but you already answered one of them, which is the testing antiviral drugs on the chip. But you said there is a, so many limitations, right? You have to work in the BL3, right? Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the second question uh, is, uh, is 
the, whether you have compared the transcriptomics uh, and other changes in the chip tissue mm -hmm. and in the, in the native tissue from human, human patients. Ah, yes. You, you mean to test the tissues on the chip? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Actually, that's why I mentioned the limitation of this work. Actually, all we used are the cell types, uh, cell lines uh, in this experiment. And due to the limitation of the samples, we don't perform the primary uh, cells from the tissues in the patients. That's the, uh, I think it's very important to conduct the, to test the primary tissue on this chip. And also actually there are, many difference uh, on the responses from the cell types and the tissues. So we hope uh, to do this in the uh, future work. So it's a very good question. And also actually it's also a challenging because if we get the primary uh, samples from the tissues, it's gonna take a long time. And we conduct this uh, work in the P3 lab. It still take a uh, quite long time to prepare the sampling. That's a very, uh, a little bit challenging here. So we hope that's a very important point to, to capture in the later work. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, great, great answer. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from panel or the audience? Or uh, I, I can, I have uh, one general question actually. So this field is new to me. I'm working on the chip. I mean, it's fairly new to me. So. I'm wondering um, how long actually can you culture these uh, cells in your chip? Is it week scale or is it month scale? Ah, okay. Yes. So actually here uh, for the cell, uh, cell lines, usually it's able to culture uh, for up to one week or two, two weeks, 10 days. And two weeks, it can, uh, the, I think is the longest time right now here. Uh, for the test, yes. Okay, okay. And, okay. Yes, and actually that's the question, if compared with the organoid system, usually for those organoid, it can maintain a long time, but uh -huh. here it, it also depends on the cell types. So if we use the primary cell from the tissue, probably, and also a big challenging, uh, it's quite challenging to capture for a long time on the chip, according to the previous study and the publications, I think. Uh -huh. The cell type, the cell lines, gonna be better. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, before I let you go, one final question is: so, in your brain chip, so have yes. you eventually seen that this virus going into the the BBB and then going into the uh, the brain cells? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, that's the actually I don't probably I don't. Uh, uh, I didn't give this question very clear. Actually, that's the main question we want to target in this work. Mm -hmm. Yes, and based on, uh, based on our results here, we find actually the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is very difficult to, pen uh, to invade the brain by BBB. That's the main result here. And also we assumed this invasion uh, probably Induce uh, the uh, the brain damage might be induced by the indirect uh, manner following the lung infection, and it may induce by the systematic uh, like the inflammatory uh, response in the mm. body. So mm. that's why we perform this work using a linked model here. I yes. see. I see. Now I got it. Yes. I'm sorry, I probably no, 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 it's okay. Yes, it's very clear. Yes. No. Good to know that the virus cannot go into the brain. That's a, <laughs> that's a relief. Yeah. Yes, because uh, lots of patients right now, they have the neurological uh, symptoms and many, many changes in the brain. And it's a very challenging question right now. So actually still many uh, other roles that might be possible involved in this uh, brain uh, damage. And that's only one of the road we try to investigate uh, to uh, like the blood road. We write, <laughs> we try to test this road in this work mm. from the baby blood brain barrier. Yes. Okay, great, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gina, for this uh, excellent yeah. talk. Um, now, okay, uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Now we can move on to our uh, the final presentation today. Well, time flies. It's already 8.40, by the way. Um, so our final presentation will be given by two experts, uh, Professor Joseph Liao from you know, Stanford University. Um, I know you also work on the, um, I mean, Joe's work on molecular imaging as well as the molecular diagnosis, you know, UTI, the urinary tract infection, and also bladder cancer. And, uh, so Joe will give the first part, and the second part with Professor uh, by Professor Jeff Wang. I mean, I mean, he's a the expert uh, in biomass and microfluidics. So, so they're going to talk about this, um, you know, detecting or combating antimicrobial resistance that uh, Dave mentioned earlier. Uh, in this uh, journal club. So, Joe, can you can you leave? Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you see my slides okay? Yes, yes. Perfect, all right. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Hako, for that very kind introduction. I wanna thank you and Jinwoo for the invitation to be part of this uh, journal club. And I very much appreciated my fellow speakers uh, and the really stimulating talks we had heard so far. Um, over the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I'm going to share you with the story of a collaboration that I have um, have formed with uh, Jeff uh, on developing technologies to combat antimicrobial resistance. Um, I've actually known Jeff for a long time. I had the pleasure for actually over 20 years. I met Jeff um, over 20 years ago when we were both at UCLA, where I was receiving my clinical training, and Jeff was um, getting his PhD, and we've... Um, have been friends ever since. Um, this collaboration, however, came about about uh, six or seven years ago where we were both at a meeting in Honolulu where I think Jeff gave a talk at seven o'clock in the morning and I was, I think, one of the two people that were there. I'm just kidding. And, and Jeff talked about droplet microfluidics and I just thought immediately the immense potential of how I could work with him and integrate this powerful technology towards molecular diagnostics. Um, as my title indicates, um, I'm a clinician, um, but I also conduct research in the area of molecular diagnostics. I very commonly like to start with a case uh, presentation. I think that sort of brings the, the sort of the unmet needs and the clinical problems home. So this is a patient, a 77 year old male who came to the emergency room with fever, chills, and flank pain. That means pain on the side. Uh, he had about two days worth of nausea and vomiting, the pain that talked about pyura means um, uh, cloudy looking urine and also decreased urine output. Um, he has a history of diabetes as well as kidney stones. Uh, in the emergency room, he had a very high temperature over 103, low blood pressure, systolic 90 over 60. Uh, he was tachycardic, the heart rate to 120 and he was breathing quite rapidly. Um, his blood test at CBC showed an elevated white count uh, with a marked um, elevation of neutrophils, um, and he had an um, uh, elevated creatinine to 1.8. He had a urinalysis, which demonstrated copious amount of white blood cells as, a, as well as red blood cells. He had a um, CAT scan uh, that's shown here, and this is a coronal view, so head is on the top, feet on the bottom, and this particular gentleman has a lot of calcium. In his body. He's elderly, so one striking thing you may notice is his aorta, which is calcified, which is unfortunately not uncommon in some of the elderly patients. You'll note here with the arrow, there is a kind of a dumbbell shape um, piece of calcium. Um, so that's in fact a stone that's infected in the ureter. And you can also look at this is the right kidney, and the right kidney uh, is very much swollen. So uh, this patient has a plumbing problem. The stone formed in the kidney, dropped down the ureter, became stuck, and now all the urine is now backing up. So the kidney is swollen, uh, and, uh, uh, and there seems to be a brewing infection that's backing up into the bloodstream. Um, so this patient has a preliminary diagnosis of um, urosepsis, which means that he fits the diagnosis of sepsis based on his vital signs, uh, we believe this is the source is from the urinary tract, so hence urosepsis, and it's due to this obstructing kidney stone. So the treatment is to start this patient on a um, very broad spectrum IV antibiotics. Um, and also uh, we emergently took the patient to the operating room where we inserted a stent 
around the stone to bypass the obstruction to basically unclog the kidney so the infected urine can now drain. Um, the patient was in ICU for a few weeks uh, just for close monitoring. And it wasn't until two days later uh, do we receive the final report from clinical microbiology that this patient had a, a very resistant form of E. coli, uh, a uh, extended spectrum beta lactam is expressing E. coli uh, and the stone. Um, so this, this case really ele 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 illustrates kind of the dilemma that we're in. We see these patients who are uh, extremely sick, uh, if not treated uh, rapidly, they could in fact um, uh, die from this illness, from a fulminating sepsis. Yet we are not really operating with very important uh, information at the point of care. And we, it's a bit of a guessing game. So what we've done as clinician is we just take bigger and bigger and broader spectrum antibiotics and sort of give it up. But the challenge, as um, Eric mentioned earlier, is that at some point we're going to run out of these powerful antibiotics at our disposal uh, and, uh, um, and such as sort of the unmet need uh, we're facing with infectious disease. So bacterial infections uh, still remains one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality um, for humankind. Doesn't matter if you're in a developing country or developed country. So life-threatening infections could be pneumonia, uh, could be some cases of urinary tract infections as I talked about. Um, however, there are other types of infections, um, skin infections, um, as sexually transmitted diseases, and other forms of infections. Common players include um, Staph aureus, as seen here, and E. coli. This is an example of a, an infected knee joint, and the entire joint has to come out. Um, and the common final pathway is something called sepsis. When all the infections from the organ of origin, it gets, get, gets into the bloodstream, and this is a manifestation of a, a clotting disorder uh, in a setting of severe sepsis where it's life-threatening. Um, as I mentioned that in my other day job, I take care of patients with urological and surgical infections. So uh, UTI or urinary tract infection could be something fairly benign, kind of a nuisance that's at the level of the bladder. Um, but if it gets into the kidney or worse into the bloodstream, it's really life-threatening. This is an example of a patient with a basically a bladder, which is what you see here that's obstructed. And all of that urine is sitting there as a culture media uh, for uh, infection. This is an example that um, we saw earlier with the impacted uh, ureteral stone. We also deal with surgical site infections, um, soft tissue infections that requires urgent um, um, debridement, uh, and deal with urine culture as well as blood culture um, since the systems are connected. Um, so the, uh, again, with this audience, I don't really need to preach uh, to the choir. Essentially, we are still very much limited by the how fast our clinical microbiology laboratory can process. So we collect a sample, that sample needs to be transported to a central lab via frequently courier service. Uh, and it takes about 24 hours or so of variety of methods to do uh, pathogen identification that not uncommonly requires that of an experienced technologist. You don't really work with samples directly from the biofluids. You have to actually, you know, get a clinical isolate, then you re-inoculate that, and then you do an antimicrobial susceptibility testing, or AST, which takes uh, not infrequently 48 to 72 hours. And at that point, then you have to inform the clinician, and the clinician at that point will either stop, start, or have to modify the anti antibiotics. Um, so we recognize that uh, there is the this emergence of multi-drug resistance pathogen is very much the worldwide healthcare crisis. So there was a national action plan put out 2015 that highlighted three areas. We need better antimicrobial stewardship. We need to develop new antibiotics. And importantly, we need to actually have faster and better diagnostics that's integrated with the other two aims. Uh, the diagnostics can uh, expedite the diagnosis. It could, uh, we can use the antibiotics more in a more focused fashion instead of something so broad. And it will also improve the workflow of clinical microbiology laboratory, which very much is dependent on technologists at this point. Um, this is a review paper that Jeff and I published um, a few years ago that talked about both new and developing diagnostic technologies for urinary tract infection. And at the top is sort of where we are. Uh, it's kind of a one size fits all. 
you take a sample, you process in a similar fashion. Uh, and as I mentioned, it takes about um, 24 hours for identification, another 24 to 48 uh, for the AST. Where we'd like to be is something uh, where I think new technologies are gonna come in. And this could be broadly divided into something that it's at the point of care. Uh, and you may a near pacing. So you, what you get there is rapidity. You get the result fast. Um, and there are a variety of platforms out there, lateral flow assays, some uh, multiplex PCR. Um, but you know, we're also not here to replace a clinical laboratory or a laboratory since there's going to be settings in which you do need the more comprehensive testing. So I think that's where the different technologies and the interplay can come in. The goal really is to develop an individual tailor approach and prescription of antibiotics. And that's really the essence of precision medicine in order to improve uh, the stewardship of our limited resources antibiotics. So my lab uh, and, and others have been working for quite some time to develop uh, amplification-free uh, UTI diagnostics. Uh, we've used a variety of platform and most commonly with this a, uh, electrochemical um, sensor in which we develop uh, a variety of um, DNA probes um, for label-free detection of um, 16 ribosome, which is a uh, part of the uh, bacteria that we have utilized as a target. Uh, and we develop assays to identify the pathogen and also utilizing um, 16S uh, as a way to quantitatively detect the growth pattern uh, of the bacteria, um, such as, and use that as a way to determine susceptibility. However, we've done this um, primarily more at a macro scale, benchtop um, bulk assays. This is just a slide on the different probes that we've developed over the years. Again, 16S is an essential component of the bacterial ribosome. It has sequences that are conserved across all bacteria, but also um, areas where there's a lot of diversity. So we can develop probes that can detect all bacteria called a uh, universal probe. We develop probes that can detect um, um, a enteric uh, gram negatives called interbacterici that you heard earlier, but also other gram negative, gram positive organisms. And this is just some of the stuff um, probes that we published in the past where we're able to uh, validate um, our probes against different clinical isolates using a universal probe, interbacterici probe, to demonstrate uh, the selectivity of the probes and the sequence where we develop them from. Um, and Recognizing that uh, there's a lot of um, effort that could be made into the design of the probes that can fully integrate into devices in collaboration with Jeff, and we set out to look at uh, a special type of um, nucleic acid probes called PNA or peptide nucleic acid probes, which is a combination uh, where you can have a, a peptide backbone with the nucleic um, side chains. And the PNA probes offer faster hybridization uh, and resistance to nuclease and across uh, the matrix that we deal with. Uh, this is just a paper a few years ago where we compare two types of PNA probes, a beacon and, and also a double strand of PNA. And we demonstrated that um, the double strand of PNA probes demonstrate a higher sensitivity compared to the beacon configuration. And we then further developed the probes again to demonstrate the specificity that we can achieve uh, with the beacon probes. But again, this assay was done in a bulk setting, and our goal was then to translate into an integrated platform. Uh, and I'm going to pass the baton to Jeff, who's going to talk about um, the droplets. Can somebody kick me out? Let's see. There we go. So. Thank you, Joe, for setting the stage. And I would also like to thank uh, HECO for organizing this meeting and also uh, for the introduction. Uh, in, can you guys see my sharing? There's uh, some one sign here. Fine, yes. Okay, yeah, there's one inside. Okay. So in our joint talk, uh, Joe uh, just first presented a clinical case and then uh, discussed the critical need for rapid diagnostics for bacterial infections. So I'm going to continue on the story and talk about uh, the single cell diagnostic technology that my lab and Joe's lab, we have been collaborating for a couple of years and then developed this uh, to facilitate rapid pathogen identification and also 
antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So for the PNA probe that Joe just discussed, it has been demonstrated this robust assay I can detect uh, uh, 16 srna of bacteria with high specificity. But as Joe mentioned earlier, that uh, this probe uh, has a, a limit of detection LOD at a level of 10 to the 7 CFU per meal. Although this is robust, but this concentration uh, is uh, higher than uh, what is typically seen the viral or the bacterial load in urine samples from UGI patients in order to enable the use of a PNA probe directly to analyze clinical urine samples. So we coupled the use of a PNA probe together with a droplet microfluidics. For the uh, droplet generated from microfluidic system, we know that the range, uh, it can be made small. So we make droplets to be uh, have volume about 10 picoliter. So if we have a bacteria uh, content in these droplets, this creates a condition that the bacterial load is equivalent to 10 to the F CF per meal. And the system SRNA that we are interested in detecting in the droplets from a single cell is equivalent to about 1 to 15 nanomolar. So this gives us an opportunity that we are able to directly detect the 16 RNA from single bacteria in urine without amplification. And even though the urine contains very low concentration, digital still allow us to be able to reliably detect this bacteria. To do so, we uh, first mix the urine sample together with our PNA probes. And using this simple flow focusing device to encapsulate bacteria into the droplets. And the droplets are going through the uh, uh, two different incubation regimes. Uh, the first one is 95 degrees, just to do thermolysis for about two minutes and then continue going through the second incubation regions at 60 degrees, where uh, the PNA start to interact and bind to the sitting SRNA and generate fluorescent signal if the droplet contains a bacteria. So the data on the right here shows the time trace of the droplet signal. For the droplet that contains single bacteria, it emits higher, stronger fluorescent signal. In contrast, uh, for the empty bacteria, it emits a very weak fluorescent background as shown uh, in these uh, orange colors of the pigs. So similarly, we also apply the drug microfluidics to facilitate rapid antimicrobial susceptibility test. Uh, one of the commonly used uh, 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 viability uh, assay is residuin. So residuin can be used to measure the viability of bacteria and can also be measured the antimicrobial susceptibility if we mix the bacteria together with the drug and major viability. So the residuin uh, itself uh, emits a very weak fluorescent signal, but in the presence of uh, metabolized produced from viable cells uh, and ADH, uh, the residuin is reduced and become uh, resurfing and is highly fluorescent. And residuin can also be measured uh, using our uh, calorimetric results it has a blue color initially, but in the presence of a metabolite, it can change to pink colors. So this uh, assay is quite simple, and it takes only four to uh, it takes uh, four to six hours to measure, but it cannot measure clinical samples directly. It has to go through precarture and isolates to have higher enough sample as an input. Then you can perform this uh, uh, four to six hours measurements of antimicrobial susceptibility test. In order to speed up the process, we again uh, in, uh, uh, apply the drug and microfluidics. So in this case, we encapsulate, we mix the bacteria cells together with drug antibiotics and also with resolution of uh, viability dye. And then we use the full focus device to encapsulate the single cell of our urine samples. And then we measure the fluorescent signal from the droplets. For the drug that contain viable bacteria, it emit fluorescent signal, which is higher. For the drug that contains uh, uh, dead bacteria killed by, by antibiotics, over empty droplets, it emits a very weak fluorescent background here. And because as what I discussed earlier, using the droplet the advantage is that the molecule will be trapped in the droplets. In this case, the metabolized NADH will be trapped in a small droplets. So even though the quantity from a single cell metabolite is tiny, but the droplets is in the picoliter range. So the concentration is still higher enough for us to reliably detect the viable cells 
even though we only allowed assay time of 30 to 60 minutes, we still can reliably detect that this bacteria content in this droplets is viable, not dead. So in order to uh, uh, measure, to conduct antimicrobial sensibility test, uh, we divide the sample into two parts. One part is no drug control. The other, the other part is the, the urine sample treated with antibiotics. Then we go through the device and then we measure the number of droplets that contain the viable bacteria. So then we compare the drug control and no, no drug control to determine the sensibility. So for the sample treated with, with drug, if the viable bacteria counts measured is comparable to the case with no drug control, then we know this drug actually continues to grow. So we know this drug is resistant to the drug that treated. In, uh, on the other hand, if uh, the sample treated with drug, the measured viable bacteria counts shows a significant reduction as compared to the no drug control. We know this drug actually has effect on the, the, the bacteria. Bacteria is dying, right? So you can uh, use this to do rapid antimicrobial sensibility test. Uh, the, the overall the single, uh, single cell droplet device are uh, offer rapid uh, uh, test capability. But the device actually has limitation. What the device that we have actually only tests one drug and one concentration at a time. But in clinical setting, physicians often want to know that uh, the same, the, the, what is really, uh, uh, they want to see that the bacteria get test against a panel of drug so they can choose from to generate the antibiogram. Also, they want to understand for each drug, uh, they want to test the multiple concentration in order to determine the minimal inhibitory concentration or MIC. So this is important information for, for the clinician. So in order to in, enhance the capacity of our device to perform multi press drug testing, we combined our uh, single cell droplet device, basically uh, we call it our pickle drop generator, together with another device that we developed many, a couple of years ago, it's called Nanoplug Assembler. So we use this nano plot assembler to mix the sample with different drugs and also at different concentration to create an array of a nano liter size plug, we call nano plug. And each of these nano plugs is sample content with different drugs and also at different concentration. So this nano plug going go through the four focusing region to produce multiple groups of a nano or uh, picoliter droplets, we call pickle drop. And then we can go through rapidly a single cell measurements to facilitate rapid antimicrobial sensibility testing. So the, uh, the nano, nano pro assembly uh, was developed a couple of years ago. Initially, it's to uh, perform combinatorial drug screening for compound screening. And then uh, uh, basically, uh, it has a multiple channel. The horizontal channel is the main channel for mixing channel. And it's also coupled to multiple vertical channel for sample inlets and reagent in the old drug uh, 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 in, in, inputs. So uh, each inlet is controlled by a valve, immune valves. So you can control, uh, you can inject a sample together with uh, one or multiple drugs using this device. So the device, uh, we can control the size of volume by controlling the valve opening time. And if you want to control the reagent concentration or the drug concentration, we can uh, control the opening time or flow rate between the two different inlet channels, and we can precisely to control the drug condition that we want to test. So then we combined uh, the uh, uh, nano assembler with the PICO injector into this new device uh, for multiplex the drug testing. So because the device that is designed to test the, 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 the drug in a way similar to a, a sample or production line, so we call this device single cell assembly line AST or scale AST. So in this device, it has six inlets. We allow one inlet for injection uh, of uh, the uh, urine sample. Uh, uh, and the second inlet is the one with the, uh, the uh, broad medium and also the uh, uh, viability dye. And the other four channels are used to inject different drugs. And using this single device, we can test the full drug and each drug at six different concentration total, 24 concentration as single device at a time. So the video here shows that uh, how this, uh, what the operation of the device. So we first generate a nano plug. So this is the plug contains sample and one drug condition. And then quickly go through run to generate 10,000 of small droplets for each drug condition. 
Then we create a barrier approach that isolated different groups. And then you can see actually you quickly generated the second uh, the uh, narrow plugs and then this another second drug condition and produce 10,000 uh, small droplets. Then we can see the in, inside the channel, there are different groups of uh, condition that we can test at the same time uh, in, inside this device. So here again, uh, for each drug, we test the six concentration and each, con each concentration, we have a 10,000 uh, small droplets to perform single cell analysis. Again, similarly for the droplets uh, that uh, contains a viable bacteria is measured with a higher fluorescent intensity. For the droplet that is empty or contain dead bacteria, it is emitted with a, a lower uh, uh, fluorescent in, in intensity. Uh, for the bacteria, uh, if the bacteria is successful to the drug, it, the sample is measured when uh, uh, the concentration of drug uh, is higher, the sample is measured with a fewer fluorescent peak and with lower concentrate, uh, with lower fluorescent intensity. Uh, to determine the MIC, uh, we call the MIC as the minimal concentration level that shows significant difference from the no drug control based on p-value. So the arrow here shows the, the MIC major from four different drugs uh, in these urine samples. And then uh, they all agree with uh, the uh, CLSI standard uh, uh, value as what are shown in this colored region. Yeah. We apply the scale AST device directly a process urine samples and to generate the single cell antibiograms. Uh, here, uh, uh, the, as here shows the stability, I is intermediate and R shows resistance. The green color is the result that measured using uh, the scale AST device. The break data indicates the results from the standard clinical microbiome labs here. And for this uh, nine patients against the four uh, different drugs, and then we create this antibiograms and we shows a pretty good uh, category agreement about 94%, uh, 94%. Uh, except that uh, we only require a fraction of time, two hours to get this antibiogram as compared to the gold standard clinical microbiome that take about two to three days to report results. And then more recently, uh, we uh, developed a more advanced device. And in this device, we perform combined bacteria identification and antimicrobial susceptibility test. The concept come back to what you just uh, discussed earlier, that we uh, try to combine the single cell device together with uh, the PNA probes, and then we can mix in the body together. And then uh, if we uh, mix urine sample, PNA probe and antibody together, and then go through the droplet devices, here then we have three different regions. The first regions had 37 degree, allow the bacteria to interact with the drugs. And then going through the, uh, the 95 uh, 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 degrees uh, regions for two minutes for cell lysis. And then the subsequently in the third regions, uh, we conduct at 60 degrees, uh, allow hybridization of PNA probe and 16S. If we can detect the fluorescent signal, as we discussed earlier, as I discussed earlier, then we confirm that this droplet contains the bacteria or viable bacteria. And then uh, we not only using the PNA probe to allow us to do identification of bacteria, more importantly, we use uh, the fluorescent intensity to help us determine the susceptibility of the bacteria. The concept is like this. Rather than using the viability dye, we using C as, as a marker. Right? In this case, if bacteria, single bacteria exposed to a drug, if this bacteria is susceptible to a drug, the, 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 the bacteria is dying or dead, so no longer producing, continues to produce C S. But if this bacteria is resistant to a drug, is still viable, still continue produ producing cysting S. So with this droplet, we will measure the fluorescent intensity is higher if this bacteria is viable, continue producing cysting S, right? So this allow us a way that not only we can do bacteria identification using PNA probe, but we can also based on the quantification of a single cell cysting S RNA to determine the susceptibility of these trends. So here it shows that uh, this is no drug control. This one is the, the, the sample treated with genomycin. And this trend actually shows that uh, with drug treatment, we detect fewer fluorescent peaks with low intensity, indicate that this bacteria is susceptible to genomycin. So uh, we also shows that what is the minimum time required allows us to differentiate resistance susceptible. As Joe mentioned about time, 
time and time is the most important thing. Uh, in uh, you need to get is a result soon. So we want to see how can we really push this uh, limits. So it shows that uh, with this essay, in fact, as as uh, little as ten minutes of interaction with bacteria, we can differentiate uh, the resistant and susceptible strains. And we can test the multiple drug with multiple different uh, species as well. So uh, as you also mentioned that earlier, for UTI, uh, ninety percent of UTI infection uh, is are uh, negative. And among this, uh, E. coli is the dominant uh, 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 the source of infection. This uh, 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 carry more, more than 75% of uh, the UTI infection are e caused by E. coli. And then uh, with this, so we decided to de de uh, 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 design a multi press probe. Uh, one is UN, uh, UNI probe, detect all the gram negative bacteria, and EC is the E. coli probe. EB is the probe, detect all the en enterobacterial groups. So with this probe, then we can direct to process the urine samples and then go through the device, then we will be able to answer different clinical scenarios, outcomes. We will answer whether or not the UTI is caused by gram negative bacterial infection. And if yes, whether or not this is caused by E. coli. And if, if no, whether or not this is belong to different enterobacterial groups. More importantly, for each of these outcomes, we answer whether or not the bacteria is susceptible to C4 processing. So CIPO is the one of the common use of oral drug and is one of the common use of UTI drug and is oral drug is pretty uh, convenient and also uh, less uh, expensive. So we validate this device with uh, 50 clinical samples here and, and we uh, for ID, uh, we got a pretty good uh, 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 results for the area under uh, RC curve, all with uh, 0.95 and above. And for the uh, CIPO fasting test, again, we also have this area on the curve of 0.95, showing that uh, this assay, despite its speed, is also quite robust in identifying bacteria and also report the, in the, the susceptibility. So uh, with this, I would like to uh, uh, con conclude our talk that uh, during now we presented our platform and then we show that uh, the use of droplet system to perform single cell measurements give us an age that we are able to, in, to perform cultural free and free detection of a bacteria directly using clinical samples. And we also found that the use of single cell 16 sRNA quantity as a surrogate marker, it allows to perform rapid antimicrobial susceptibility phenotypical test. And in the end, we show that if we combine this all together, combine single cell RNA detection with multiplex DNA pro in droplets, we demonstrate that it is possible to perform integrated bacterial detection and the antimicrobial susceptibility testing in less 15 minutes. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, show and I would like to thank our collaborators and uh, uh, she here. And uh, we really enjoy the story that uh, Joe shared with you. In fact, this uh, project uh, was sponsored by uh, uh, this uh, NIH grants. This was a grant that uh, Joe uh, mentioned about that we were in Hawaii talking about it with So. Give us uh, this uh, pretty fun journey of uh, the past five and six years uh, to produce uh, this uh, results on single cell uh, diagnostics. So with this, I think uh, for your, your attention. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is wonderful. I mean, great, great technology.